Um, well, hello and welcome to those people who've come along so far. There are a few of you. Um, as usual, not everybody who signed up is there at the start, but hopefully that won't put anybody off. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I'm Ed Mead and that's, <laughs> that's me, I'm Peter Rollins. That's got his microphone on. He's not very good at all the tech stuff. Um, I thought you introduced me, Ed. He's younger, but significant. So um, actually, we are um, here to talk about our time as estate agents, really. Um, there is a, an opportunity for you to ask questions if you want. Um, I think that's all there on your panel. So if you do want to ask some questions, please do. But from our point of view, um, I think we had a golden period in our lives back in the well, 90s, which actually I'm embarrassed to say even in the 90s, that was my third decade in a state agency because I was I started off in the late 70s. Um, Peter was a little bit. You were a bit later than that, I think, Peter, weren't you? When did you start? <laughs> I started in 83. 80, 83. Okay, okay. So, um, I mean, and, obviously, and obviously the market was very different in those days, but actually the most, um, just to talk about my experience when I started for a second, um, I mean, I started working for Chesterton's in 1979, and in those days, uh, Chesterton's was a very different business from what it is now, but it was an old fashioned partnership, and they um, espoused the approach that you went around all their offices and learnt how the business worked. So yeah. I ended up working in Mayfair, Kensington, Chelsea, Pimlico. Um, <clears throat> it was fantastic fun, but the important thing was it really taught you how it worked and I think I'm presuming your experience was the same because I think you started off at Struts or Lane Fox or something. No, Lane Fox, yeah, for three years, literally being an office boy, literally making coffee, picking up plans from Cook, Hammond and Kell in wherever that was in in, uh, in Westminster somewhere, drawing plans for farms and estates. Yeah, it was a very, very different life. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a different life, but, but it sort of taught you how it all worked. And of course, yeah. in those days, it was a much slower business. Yeah, no mobile phones, <laughs> barely any photographs on details. I remember sticking little tiny pictures that big, you know, and then photocopying those in black and white to go out on the details. Yeah. Very, very different ball game, but it was great fun. But I suppose, um, I mean, the period that was what I would consider to be a, a golden period really in the industry was that period when um, you and I were in competition. Yeah. When I was running the Douglas and Gordon office in Chelsea and you were running the Foxton's office in South Ken. And yep. obviously you went on to 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 run Foxton's. But I think I, I and and you were very good at that. Annoyingly, you were very good at that. Um, but for me, anyway, I found that that era of um, being an agent, my main job was to stand out from the opposition. I mean, I was working in a market in Chelsea, which didn't have as many players as it, did, as it does now. But uh, when I arrived, I looked around and there were a lot of people who wore suits, a lot of people who drove golfs or BMWs, and a lot of people who uh, were looking much the same. And you know, the, the business then ran much as it does now. People who wanted to sell their property tended to get three agents around and they stood in front of them and did their pitches and then they'd decide which one they wanted to use. That's the way it worked and it still does. So and my reckoning a lot in half commission, Ed. Is that it? Was that that was that the issue in those days? Because I mean, at Foxtons, as you know, we never reduce fees. Um, and my understanding of 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 the enemy, as we called them, <laughs> were um, <laughs> were that they sort of did a lot of thing on half commissions. They share commissions. They charge two and a half percent, but actually get one and a half and give one away. Uh, obviously, that's changed because everyone now seems to charge one percent, and there's nothing to share. It, was that did that make a difference to the market in those days? Um, I think it did, but it was always the same. You only tended to give away commission when you were a bit desperate. Um, yeah. Desperate's the wrong word, but you know when you when you'd had your period yourself, you've got a period of sole agency. You know the usual. Everyone watching this will know you get whatever eight, twelve weeks, sixteen yeah. weeks, yeah. Yeah. Six, months, six months if you were Foxtons. Um, and of course, this was pre right move. This was pre pre right move, Zoopla, anything. I mean, we had nothing like that. We had the Sunday Times and we had the Evening Standard and we had at Foxons, we had our own magazine, which we produced, I think it was 300,000 copies a month. That was our right move. Uh, well, the, the thing that differentiated you guys, but the thing that differentiated you guys was your board presence. Yeah. And yeah. I don't really want to get into the niceties of what you did about boards and all that sort of stuff. And I'm sure you there'll be a We were able to, Ed, obviously. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure whether there's legal counsel listening, but um, <laughs> board presence was was really how you guys 
uh, you and would still is these days. I, I read something this week that uh, I think Trevor Abramson said in, in North London. He said, well, we always used to say we would stop advertising in all, all media if we could just have one thing, it would be boards. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think these days, I mean, I used to do, at Foxons, we used to do a board run every single week. I used to have a car full of managers uh, and uh, in my region, and we used to go around and we used to check boards were there. We used to check boards were straight. We was check they were clean. And if we had didn't have any boards on anything, and this was lettings and sales managers in the back of my car, uh, we would order them there and then every week without fail. It was a massive attention to detail. And for those of you listening uh, who don't do that and protect your board presence like it's the most important thing you've got because it is, then you're missing a trick. And they only cost six quid a pop, or they used to in those days. It must have been a very big car, Peter, for you to fit all your managers. It was a that. Range Rover, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> my Chelsea yeah. tractor <laughs> well for those listening of course this was Chelsea but okay so it didn't matter that Chelsea and South Ken I mean you know they're okay they're posh markets very out market markets but they're still markets and you have to differentiate yourselves from the opposition so I was talking just now about how from from my perspective at Douglas and Gordon I was keen to try and um uh, what's right well, well stand out from the opposition so the way I did it having having done a bit of research um, was to, number one, I rode a motorbike, and anyone who worked in Chelsea at the time will remember, I drove a motorbike with a ruddy great stripy sort of paint job on it, which was our logo, effectively, all over the motorbike, number one. And number two, um, <laughs> I wore a red fleece. So when I went in to do valuations, um, you'd have two people coming in in suits. I'd always, you know, we all know that the ideal position to be a, a, on the valuation is the last one, and you need to take in a thing saying, are you ready to sign now? I mean, that's that's why you want to be last when you're going in. But if you can be last and look completely different, I'm fairly sure that the majority of people who's, who I went to see, if you talked to them afterwards and said, well, which of the people did you remember? It would be, it, you know, they might have said the git in the red fleece, but they wouldn't have forgotten me, you know. So, um, so, for me, that was a big difference. And obviously at, at Foxton's, you took that to the nth degree with your minis. Was that why you did it with the minis? Well, it was it was something to, I, I mean, I think the minis came about because boards in Kensington, Chelsea and Westminster were banned. Uh, you know, th those were the days that you needed planning commission. And therefore, <clears throat> we used to have reams of boards up and down Queensgate and Elverston Place and you name it. And, uh, and suddenly we had none. Uh, and so we were judged on uh, our presence of offices, which were, um, few and far between. Those days we were covering big areas from hubs, which is interesting. It sort of seems to be going back that way now, which is yeah, quite an interesting thought. Um, yeah. And of course the magazine. The magazine was absolutely integral to our success. Um, and I, I must say uh, uh, what we'd call client services. You know, I remember the days of sitting behind my desk at um, in in South Ken and uh, you know it was a it was a quiet morning perhaps at ten o'clock in the morning I'd get my lever arch file out and I'd open it and I'd get to about C the, and everything would kick off and I'd put the lever arch file back so if your if your surname or or, or property address didn't it began with anything D and on I never you never heard from me ever again um, which is why we set up client services which was specifically designed for people to just do that. And, and again, if you can do it in any size of business, I did it at Marsh and Parsons in month one with one guy, 19 year old guy, guy called Tom Smedley. He pitched me and said, let me do this for you. And I thought, no, too early. It certainly wasn't. And we were unable to really punch above our weight because we kept in touch with people. And frankly, that is 90% of the battle. If people remember you like they do with you, Ed, and then you keep in touch, it's a, it's a win-win. Well, it's a win-win unless you're the, the poor recipient of the calls every six months. What are you doing? Hello, this is Fox and Chip. <laughs> I always used to say, if anyone ever, and this went back to those days, when mobile phones first came out, I said, if ever you want to do a deal with Foxtons, you buy a you buy a pay-as-you-go mobile phone. <laughs> you do the deal, you only give them that number, and as soon as the deal's finished, you chuck the phone in the bin. <laughs> Otherwise, you get called every six months. Right. Rest of your but we, actually, certainly, we certainly pissed people off. Uh, of course we did, but I would guess a vast number more we kept in touch with and they wanted to hear from us when the time came. Yeah, you, 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 of course you annoyed people. And it was often said to me at Foxton's, geez, you're so aggressive, uh, you will piss everybody, everybody off before long and you won't have any clients. And year after year after year, our numbers improved. So it doesn't yeah, work. I don't think you 
doing? I don't, uh, hang on a minute. Sorry, I've got a barking. <laughs> well, I'll keep talking. Uh, year after year, the numbers improved um, because we did what we said we would. And what we said we would is to go out and get the most amount of money. You may not like us. You may not, you may not admire us, but you will grudgingly admire us, I would guess, uh, at Foxtons because we did what we said on the tin, which is not be your best friend. Go out and get the most amount of money. These days, I think Foxtons uh, don't do that. I think they've sort of lost their way slightly, that they're, they're neither one thing nor the other. They're not hyper aggressive and they're not um, uh, they're not super slick. I don't think I might, might be doing a, a disservice, but I think I preferred the days when you knew what exactly what you were going to get when you instructed Foxtons, which was an absolute tirade of, of, of viewings and phone calls and <clears throat> to get you to get you the most amount of money. Yeah, well, I think I think you were doing a disservice to people when you said they didn't like Foxtons. They absolutely hated Foxtons, um, <laughs> in much the same way that that agents these days tend to be, you know, tend to have yeah. it in for the for the for the Purple Brigade. You know, it's very much the same sort of um, anybody who seems to be being. I don't know whether it's an English thing or not, but the moment someone appears to be being successful, they're sort of, you know, someone tries to knock them down. Everyone being, but, it everyone is I, but I do think that, that it's it's interesting to look at that differentiation thing because certainly back then in the 90s, you, you, as you say, you didn't have right move, you didn't have a lot of the sort of tech that you have now. Um, and I think quite a lot of the problems people have with tech is that they only, particularly estate agents, will only um, indulge in tech or cha change and, and encompass tech if people demand it. So if their customers start saying, well, why aren't you doing this or why aren't you doing that? That's what will change their minds. Hmm. And I think you, I think Foxton's was, I mean, you know, my thing in Chelsea of trying to look different was, was great and it did work. It definitely helped. I mean, I'd like to think I knew what the hell I was on about because I've worked in the market for already at that time for 20 years. But um, you guys took it to a whole different level. And I think John Hunt just had, and, and, possibly you as well, had um, an enormous amount of foresight. You know, that thing of making your, uh, making your, I mean, whose idea was it to make shop fronts look like coffee bars? His idea. Uh, he, he was so far ahead of his time. <clears throat> he was he was a genius, I thought. Um, and, and he used to say things to me, um, I mean, <laughs> targets, for instance, you know, he could sort of see the market sort of certainly a year ahead. And I, he'd set me targets for the, for the business. And I'd say, you must be bloody joking. And we'd hit him because he would see what was going on. And we all did to a certain extent. I, you know, that's what I, how I did what I did at Marshall Parsons. You know, uh, John, as, as, as is famously known, uh, didn't give any equity away to anyone. Uh, I was there 20 years and got not a bean. But what I did get, and I, and I genuinely never look back on that uh, with, any, with any sort of um, antagonism or any sort of uh, anger, what I got was the knowledge of what to do, how to do it to build another business. And Marshall Parsons was a a combination of that very hyper aggressive Foxtons and the uh, much nicer, more charming people. If you can combine those, you have a winning, uh, a winning position. I used to say at Foxtons, you enjoy the result, but you're not sure about the, the experience. In fact, you might hate the experience, but you'll enjoy the result. There are other agents, I shall, name, I shall not name them, where you think they're charming, lovely people, but you've no idea whether you've got the most amount of money. Yeah. And that's the key. Agents are here, in my view, to get the most amount of money. If you can combine that with charming, absolutely brilliant service, then you will stand out from the crowd because 90% of the stage agents still aren't very good. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, we all know that unfortunately our business tends to get dragged down to the lowest common denominator, so standing out is really important. Um, and I'd like to think actually that's what the new style D and G is. I mean, as we know, the guy that's now taken over and is running D and G is an ex Foxtons guy, and he's, he has a much more um, Foxton style view of it. And I think D and G, when I was there, was a very nice company, but it was a different day, and it was it was possible to make money and be nice. Nowadays, if you're nice, I'm afraid, if you haven't got the commercial edge, I think that that you're 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 really likely to get squashed. But one of the other things that I think, I mean, Foxtons really didn't need to do this. Um, but the other thing that that I did, which which definitely changed what we were doing, was actually to engage in PR. Yeah, and I think people do really don't understand how PR works. PR is very difficult to get right. PR is not about ringing up journalists and saying I've got a lovely house for sale. I mean, it may be if you've got a fantastic house, 
you know, sitting somewhere and it's very unusual and whatever, then yes, that's worth sending out to people. But what people, what, it, what journalists want is someone who definitely knows what they're talking about, B, is happy to say it very quickly, and C, is happy to be available whenever they want. So, yeah. <clears throat> you know, these days you quite often read, particularly with Twitter, and, and uh, because you, you will often see a journalist, and that's why it's worth A, definitely, if you're in business, having in your state, have a Twitter account, and B, yeah. follow the journalists. Yeah. Because the journalists often say, oh, I need someone who's got a penthouse flat or whatever it is, you know, something un slightly unusual. And if you've got one, you can respond to them straight away. And they want to ring you up and talk. And if a journalist calls you up and says, can I just talk about that thing you just sent me or I see you've got this thing for sale, never turn around to a journalist and say, can I call you back tomorrow morning? <laughs> you know, they will just go on to the next person. So PR, just those three simple things, know what you're on about, um, you know, be able to say it in a few words and be available. And I think you'd agree that the profile that I built up at Douglas and Gordon, and indeed the Douglas and Gordon profile, was just out of all proportion to the value. Ed Mead profile. Well, I mean, <laughs> it, I was always Ed Mead at Douglas and Gordon, so it was, and, and I know that you were very, um, what's the right word, you were always quite funny about the fact that I was allowed to tweet as, as at Ed Hype underscore Mead rather than at yeah. Douglas and Gordon, because you always tweeted as at Martian Parsons. Um, and so I was off yeah. all my followers. Yeah, anyway. well, you haven't gained many back, have you? Yourself? No, that's true. I, yeah. I don't. I don't often tweet now. That's the thing. But Ed, on that subject, I always used to have a rule: if I got a, a blocked call on my mobile, I number withheld. I always took it because it would it would very often be a journalist, and they would just literally they'd call a, a, an agent, and then if they didn't answer, they'd call another one. So almost whatever I was doing, if I was in a meeting, whatever, I'd answer that phone. And if it wasn't a journalist, I'd say, "I'm sorry, I'm in a meeting. Can I call you back?" But I would answer that call. Are you implying, though, Peter, that people seriously these days don't answer calls because it's a withheld call? A oh, lot. Yeah. Do you? Well, I certainly, think, if they're busy, yeah. Yeah, I think that's amazing. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I you're know. absolutely right to point that out. No, no, you're absolutely right. If you get someone calling from Times, FT, whatever it is, they will always have a withheld number. That's, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. And they're very, very really good. But I think the, the, the reason for mentioning that was just that I can remember one of the first... And I can't remember, because I started at that office in D&G in, what, 94, 95, something like that. And um, there had just been, we were coming to the end of that terrible period from 88, 89. That was a really, really, really Four long years. session. And I remember, um, I think it was Annabelle Hessel time. Someone had obviously talked to her about, you know, she would wanted to find out more about the, about the Chelsea and South Kensington markets. And... She was working at the Telegraph at the time and she rang me up and said, you know, can we talk about this? And I said, yeah. And I, and I, I just said, why don't I take you round on the back of my bike? And it was just <laughs> you extraordinary. Smooth walker, you. <laughs> <laughs> but it was extraordinarily effective it had. She wrote a fantastic double page spread. And actually, that's what launched it. Um, a certain person who, you know, I'm, I know very well, who obviously did my PR at that stage and was extremely good at. But I do think that there never underestimate the PR thing. You guys didn't need it. Foxton's at that no. time didn't need it because you had... Ed, in, in a, in a, obviously, some, some of the people listening you know, aren't in central London and perhaps don't have so many things to talk about, but there are definitely things in all parts of the UK and all parts of the towns that if you make yourself the go-to person for that region, for that area, then the journalist will call you and, and your PR will, 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 will shoot it'll it'll get it'll it'll increase dramatically but you have to be make an effort with the journalist who write in the area the local papers the magazines whatever it may be uh, yeah. I, I assume there still is some i'm sure that well there is around here so uh, i'm sure in all parts of the country there are local I'll papers. Tell you right now, local papers are enjoying a resurgence and the Absolutely. reason they're doing that is that they're that they're obviously having to make their uh, newspapers micro websites so and, and they're looking for go-to people to put information up yep. on their websites. So yep. it's, you know, local papers are something that people should be re-engaging with, not yep. um, not looking to shy away from. I mean, that's easy to say because people have budgets. And as you say, um, wherever you are in the UK, um, you can you can definitely make an impact. But I think um, I remember um, talking to someone who worked at Savills, and she said to me that of the entire company at Savills, there were literally two or three people that they would want to put on, that they would be happy putting in front of a camera or a microphone. And that's yeah. not because yeah. the people that are working there aren't great estate agents, but the, the, the ability to have someone that's able to stand in front and talk sensibly. 
I mean, most people, when a camera gets turned on, it's taken you about 20 years to learn to talk into a camera. I was, I was always brilliant, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but most people, when a camera's point out, they just immediately go like that. They just yeah, you know, they they get really nervous, and, 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 they, and it's a very, very difficult thing to get right. So try and find, try and find in your business, if, you, if, you've, if you're looking to try and engage with PR, A, try and find something in the business who is good at it, and that's not always easy, but you might just get a media trainer in for the morning yep. and just get everyone to sit in front of them. And the media trainer might just say, that person's an absolute yep. natural at this and make them your spokesman, number one. And number two, do consider, and it's, it's not expensive, wherever you are in, in the UK, there are some very, very good PR agencies out there. Uh, I'll rephrase that. There are a lot of PR agencies, not all of them are good, but there are some good ones out there. And it is worth trying to find one or two. I mean, if anybody wants to know who I would recommend, I'm not going to say it on air, but I do have a couple of people I would recommend that people can go to. So if you want to know, um, I just send an email. Frozen, as far as I'm concerned. You what? Say again. Are you back in the room, Ed? Uh, I am back in the room. Why? Are you uh, have I because have I you were, you were frozen. frozen? You were frozen. Oh, okay. Well, hang on a minute. Let me um, let me try and unfreeze myself. Hold on. Uh, am I back yet, Peter? That's it. Yeah, you are. Oh, good. Okay. I've been having problems with BT coming in. It's so annoying. I can't tell you. You pay for it, BT Infinity. You might as well get, you know, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, whatever. It, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, no, so what I was saying was this thing about um, about looking at people and, and, in, and employing a someone on PR because it just just does do an absolutely enormous amount for your profile and I think that was one of the main things I did that was but, different. But even on a even on a smaller scale because because certainly not everyone is going to employ a PR company a one and two offices two office uh, business if you become if you make an effort to get hold of the journalists and become the go-to person for a comment on the local market it can do you enormous amounts of good I mean I, I used to have that in South Ken uh, battling with you. I'm afraid you won that battle because <clears throat> you're more of a media tart than me. Um, but in, in, in Marsh and Parsons in general, you know, they came to me a lot for London-wide um, uh, comments. And, and I made myself very available. And, and they came for comments. And um, but, but you used to do when you were in Marsh and Parsons, and I know you used to hate it. You used to do that monthly video blog. It's sort of video blog thing, didn't you? Yeah. And, and you used to hate doing that. But you <laughs> did did that work? How how come that doesn't still happen? I have no idea. If I was, it's like anything. If you're on song and you can sort of, you've got it all off pat, you can, you know exactly what you want to say, then it went brilliantly. Um, other than that, it was sometimes a bit of a pain. But it was, I think it worked. Yeah, I got, I got a few comments about it, mostly positive. So I think, I think it worked. But these days, there are loads of people like Richard Rawlings and these types who, who spend a lot of time writing content for people for their yeah. agencies to, to sort yeah. of send out. And whilst I think that's a good, that actually probably proves, A, that there's a necessity for it, and B, that it seems odd to me that if you had someone in the agency who could put this sort of stuff together, because what Richard's doing is just really finding out easily available information and just putting it into an easily assimilatable form. I mean, these days people have got, people these days aren't really that interested in the fact that their property, their house value has gone up by 0.1%. They don't really care about that anymore. They're, they're more interested in reading about local schools, what makes the area worth living in, uh, all this sort of stuff. Mm. Um, and I do think that your magazine was a classic example. D&G did it, actually. We did Bridge Magazine for a bit, which yep. was we did it for four years. It was, a, it was very successful. And of course, what people forget is that that sort of advertising was what was designed to bring in sellers. Because when, yep. when, when a magazine drops on people's doorsteps, they don't tend to look at it for something to buy. They look at it because if they're going to buy something, they'll go to Rightmove or On The Market or Zupa or whatever. They'll look at it and they'll think, oh, this agent sells this sort of property. I must, they're one of the agents I must get in. So, um, you know, quite how you do that these days. I think people are, I don't know, do you, do, you, do you still think that doorstepping or dropping stuff through people's letterboxes has a place? I do. Yeah, I really do. Uh, and I, I'll never forget the, the chief exec of Douglas and Gordon at the time uh, ran an advert uh, saying, you will never get anything through the door from us ever again. And I, I literally had a party. I thought it was the best thing he could possibly have done to benefit me. Um, and he, he actually told me a very funny story, which was a mate of his. Um, uh, he'd instructed Foxton's, a good mate of his, instructed Foxton's. And when he asked him why, 
he said, well, Fox and wrote to me and said they had a, a ready, willing and able buyer who's just missed out on something down the road. <laughs> Don't think that doesn't work because it absolutely does. Uh, and it's, it's often true. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it isn't. It's often true. And you will have three or four buyers who are perfect for that because you've just sold one nearby. Whether they're ready, willing and able is a different matter. But um, it is designed to open doors. And what, what agents marketing should do is open doors for you to get in the door to get your people in the door and then they do their bit but you can't if you don't buy a ticket you can't win a prize and so you've got to open that door first and that comes down to marketing it comes down to being absolutely religious about those telephone calls in the mornings the morning call out session i i don't know if everyone does that but if they don't if they don't have some sort of time management of managing salespeople, because if you let salespeople do what they want they will uh if, if that isn't focused one morning a week on hot buyers i with something to sell then you're missing out again. Yes, one of the other things that we used to do, which used to open doors, I had a really good relationship with the with the person who ran our rental department. And I very often used to take, when I went along, normally on valuations, I used to like going along on, or market appraisals, whatever you want to call them, we still call them valuations, which is probably a bit of a misnomer, but anyway. Um, I used to love going on my own. I never wanted anybody else to hear my sort of bullshit. <laughs> I just wanted to sort of, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I found the, I found sitting in front of people incredibly exciting, being able to tell where they were, whether they were liking what I was saying by the, the slight inflection in their eyes, the change in their face, immediately altering it slightly. Yeah. But what I did find worked, if I was going to take somebody, and I often did, was, was to take the head of lettings. Because even if they didn't want it, you could come along and say, look, I've just bought, I've just bought um, so and so along. Um, you know, we may have some landlords, who, some investors who might want to buy your property. We just need to get a good idea of what it's worth. So, that, you know, that sounds brilliant. I mean, people really like that. And yeah. I mean, I was used to be slightly amazed when people used to say in some of our offices, um, oh, you know, I'm doing 30, 40 valuations a month. I'm so busy. Well, you know, you've got 30 working, whatever it is, 25 working days in the month. 30 valuations is just just over one a day. So it's not like people can't spare the time to really focus on winning that instruction. And I think absolutely, um, I know perfectly well that some agents side that they skip some valuations. They'll, they'll say, do you know what? I really don't want that. You know, I was guilty of that when I was working. There were some bits of Chelsea in those days, even Chelsea in those days. There were some bits where you really wouldn't want to have lived. And I used to think, oh, no, do you know what? I'm not able to sell that. So I'm not going to go and look at it. And it was a mistake because you never know when those places we all know that marketing a property doesn't cost an enormous amount of money. You're already spending the money on the shop yeah. and the staff and everything else. So why not take something on? It doesn't matter whether it's a million pounds or a hundred thousand pounds or even 50,000 pounds or 10,000 pound garage or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I still think that swerving those valuations is not a good idea, but. Um, I totally agree. Uh, and obviously um, we're, uh, selling our book for a moment. If you're, if you, if you need to do more, more valuations and you haven't got time to do your appointments, You've got a ready, willing, and able five and a half thousand viewers across the country now. How many have we got now? Uh, it's under seven thousand, actually. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't want people to think we're here to talk about that. But it is, you know, that, that's the kind of tech. I mean, you know, back in back in those days, we used to um, working. The, the idea of working at weekends was a complete no-no. But that was the way it was. It <laughs> I mean, but then again, having said that, you used to open seven days a week in those days. We did. You? We did. And I'll tell you why we didn't in the end. It, that was when was that? That was uh, late eighties, I suppose, early nineties. And it was it was when I started. It was nine till nine, seven days a week. Now we then turned it to nine to five on a Saturday and Sunday. But we what we found we were just uh, getting through so many staff and the quality of staff we were getting because we actually worked either either Saturday or Sunday. So till eight or nine at night uh, nine in the early days and Saturday or Sunday and the quality of staff just wasn't there we, we couldn't we stopped being able to hire literally anybody uh, and so we changed it and we cut out Sundays which wasn't which which we weren't doing well on um, but you know having said that uh, people when you pay them on commission uh, come in on Sundays if they're if they're focused heavily and I was paid three and a half grand plus ten percent uh, if they're focused heavily on commission it's running their own business. They'll come in on a Sunday. Sorry, and you were paying three and a half grand. Well, that was their basic salary. Yeah. That was a long time ago. <laughs> well, it's not much more now. It's only 10 grand now. Out of over three and a half grand a week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it uh, well, it it focuses the mind a bit, doesn't it? If you if you don't do a deal in a month, uh, three and a half grand is something like I've forgotten what it was. It was something like two hundred and twenty quid a month. I mean, it was ridiculous. So, guess what? You worked hard. It's really yeah. not that complicated. I mean, I, it, it, the part of the reason I mentioned earlier the thing about lettings is that there's still such a demarcation between lettings and sales, and there's still the kind of people that certainly that we had who used to work in lettings and sales and the sort of people I come across still who work in lettings and sales are diametrically opposite. Yeah. You know, we, we used to do this psych, this psychometric testing on people when they came to work at D&G. And it wasn't the way we employed them, but it told us what they'd be good at. It didn't alter whether we employed them or not. But the number of people we used to get coming in saying, yeah, I'm 22 and I want to work in sales and I want to make a fortune. And they'd sit down and we'd do the, 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 the psychometric test. And it would very clearly tell us that they were going to be good at lettings. And we'd say, you do realize that actually we think you're going to be better at letting. No, I want to do sales. Six months later, they'd be, they'd be coming back saying, mm, can I try sales? Can I try lettings, please? Yeah. And they are very different. So often the people who run sales and the people who run lettings, because they're very, very different people, they just don't, talk, you know, forget a Chinese wall. It's like a huge, great, you know, such a great wall of China. No one ever sort of communicates. So. To try and get that cross flow of people, you know, yep. I, heaven knows how many instructions I lost because I, I didn't badger Virgin Nettings and say, Virginia, and say, look, you know, one of your landlords, if, if someone served notice on a tenant, the very first thing you should be doing is ringing up and saying, the salesperson should be ringing up saying, is there anything I can do to help sell it? But even those basic things, I don't think, happen these days. There are so mm -hmm. many things that, that we didn't get right in those days that we could have got better. Um, and I'd like to say that actually part of the reason that it was it was such fun was that I, I don't think I think you uh, you grasped the opportunity and John made sure that you absolutely maximized it. Yeah, I don't think we I don't think we probably maximized what we could have done. But one of the other things for anybody who um, one of the things that really worked for us. Uh, and this is slightly different because we were central London, but these days it doesn't matter where you, are, where you are in the UK, if you're East Coast, Northeast, whatever, you're going to get a lot of um, foreign speaking people, probably. Um, you know, if you're on the East Coast, it's likely to be from Eastern Europe. You know, they're also have people working in your agency who speak the languages of the people that live there. Yeah, I remember yeah. Nick, who used to work in an office, was fantastic. He'd see someone walking into the office, he'd just be able to tell from the way they were dressed or in the way they looked, what that, and as they came in, he'd get up and he'd start talking to them in their language. I mean, he did speak seven, which helps. So it's quite unusual, but okay. but nevertheless, that was just a complete game changer. It just yeah. people instantly went, "Whoa, hang on a minute!" They were so used to this homogenous style of estate agent that to have someone who was yeah. talking to them in their own language was spectacular. Mm. Uh, equally, I mean, the the feeling comfortable that means that that person felt comfortable in the office. What why we did the cafe style environment uh, at, at, at Foxons is because all the research we looked at is is that uh, walking into an estate agent is a very very intimidating experience, uh, and and as, and if you don't have a central centralized front reception, then very often you walk in. And lots of people look at you like this, and then many of them sort of look back and sort of pretend you're not there, which seems extraordinary to me, as that's how they're going to make their money. But it happens every time, and you're sort of left, sort of very uncomfortable, standing at the front, wondering if anybody's going to help. So, again, for those of you listening and looking, really have a look at your office, stand at the back or stand outside, and see what happens when people walk in and how they feel. You know, our, our, we call them um, office coordinators, which is another is a posh word for receptionist. You know, they were they were trained to stand up, smile, say good morning, welcome to Marsh Parsons. You know, that's you, you're halfway through the battle then that people feel ah, I can relax. These people are nice and they're going to be pleasant to me. And then the whole process starts. And at Foxons, if they, they then be offered a lovely cappuccino or a, or a bottle of Coke or something, then the whole process was. You know, you've got them. You've got them for a while. They're relaxed. They're sitting down, and and you can start the process, the, the sales process. Really important. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Walking into an office is very intimidating, but the English are quite bad at walking into anywhere and getting eye contact. And yep. I suppose these days, I don't know. I wonder how pre how how prevalent that still is. Do people really still go into agents? I mean, at D and G, we did some research about, correctly, it's only about four years ago, where we tried to analyse. We asked a lot of people. Uh, which agent they would instruct and and the majority of people still said they it was an agent that they walked past regularly yep it's still 
Sales, yeah. but, um, sellers, I think, well, if I was selling, I, I would definitely walk into a, a, and, and see exactly that. You know, see how I'm made to feel. See if they give a shit. Because frankly, if they don't care, then they don't care. And they're not going to look after me or my property. And therefore, and that's before they know I'm selling. So if they prejudge me to be someone they don't really care about, then they're not for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a very interesting um, area. I mean, look, we've been, we've, we've kept people with us who've been listening. No one's asked any questions, which is fine. I'd like to think, I mean, you know, I'd, I'd like to do this more often. I mean, the fact of the matter is I've been doing this for 40 years. Peter's been doing it for nearly that long. Um, so, and, and I, d I mean, has the industry changed much? You know, I don't think it has. I think the tools people use have changed, but it's still a people business. Um, quite how that's changed with the sort of purple bricks revolution and, and things changing. I, I suspect that we're a long way from the end of that. I think there are some people who are sort of trying to signal the death knock. You've always been much more um, conservative about that and always thought, no, I don't understand how it works and it's never going to work. Fascinating, but still the ultimate thing always ends up coming down to service. And that's what I used to love. Yep. I used to absolutely love that bit of it. And and I think becoming a sort of personality in your area was always incredibly important. I'm not sure you needed that because Foxton's you didn't because you weren't a great personality anyway, frankly. And and the Foxton's name gave you what you missed from that perspective. So it was yeah. <laughs> it was <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was good. It was, it was a very good time. Funnily enough, both of us were trounced, in, even in those days. No, who by? Uh, I don't believe it. By, by one company that works on Chelsea Green, who um, was run by a guy who was born and brought up in Chelsea and whose turnover was absolutely ginormous. And I mean, his turnover dwarfed even what you were doing. I mean, I know what his figures were. I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, but he, he I know exactly who you're talking about, and he's, a, he's a, a god of a state agency, I think, but he was quite a limited god in his area and in his price range, which was yeah, but, way up. But, but, but that's that was exactly what we were talking about earlier. I mean, you know, um, I mean, interestingly, uh, actually, having just said, no one's asked a question, the lovely Kevin Ellis has just asked a question here saying, no, where, do you see agents getting, where do you see agents getting growth from in times when, when there's lots of competition and low fees? I mean, I don't think it's any coincidence these days that um, Countrywide's last set of figures said that for every pound they make out of a state agency, they make 43p in referrals. Mm. And I think that whole referrals thing, frankly, we could have another whole conversation about that. I mean, obviously, I just hope that the government doesn't do what they did with tenant fees and say they're going to have a consultation, get two weeks into the consultation period and then just announce that they're going to ban them. Mm -hmm. If they did that with referrals, I think that would be a disaster because what people forget and, you know, as usual, it'll be the rotten apples who cause the problems with this. It'll be the people who absolutely tear the arse out of referrals and, and rip people off. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the thing about referrals is why would an agent recommend someone who's bad? If you're trying to sell something, you want to sell it quickly and efficiently. Yeah. Um, so why would you refer an idiot? So I never understood why there's a problem with this. But clearly it is a problem because I tell you right now, the government will ban. I sit on the, the um, industry forum for the TPO. And the TPA represents over 90% of estate agents. And I can tell you, the minister came in to talk to us at our last forum. And he said um, that they're now looking at exactly what's happening in the next 12 months. And that started two months ago. So there's 10 months of this left. And if they don't like what they see, they'll just ban them. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what the country, I mean, you know, I thought country was a good buy at one pound. It's now 7p. Can you imagine what someone, what, what, country, what would happen to Countrywide if a third of their income was suddenly taken away? So, Kevin, one of the things I'd say is that, I mean, obviously, referrals is going to continue to, is going to, continue to provide growth. Um, Kevin's, it's a slightly loaded question because Kevin runs a fantastic setup called the Land and New Homes Network, um, which is designed to help agents cash in on the Land and New Homes explosion. And that's definitely part of it, yeah. Yeah, which we all want to see. And New Homes is an area that all agents have really struggled with. Yeah. I mean, even referrals, just to finish on that, you at Martian Parsons never got that right. I know it, the only reason you got it right at Foxton's was because you had Alexander Hall and just shoved everything straight into Alexander Hall. That's yep. quite difficult these days with GDPR. Um, but um, land and new homes, at D&G, we really struggle with new homes. I know you still struggle with it even at, even at M&P. Yep. 
which is why something like the Land and New Homes Network is so useful, because to pull the whole network of people together, they can then compete with CBRE, JLL, Knight Frank and Saddles, who have the resources to back all these things up. So um, I think that is an area for growth. Referrals and Land and New Homes, I don't know, do you have any other thoughts on that? Uh, uh, not really apart from the others, which is lettings. Uh, there's still agents out there who don't do lettings. Um, I think there's very few now. Um, but in my day of, 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 you know, certainly at Foxton's, we started lettings in 89 and it's the only thing that kept us going through the, um, through the recession. And at M&P, uh, lettings was a tiny bit of the business, which we very aggressively grew because we knew it would be a hedge against downturn. I mean, lettings now for many businesses, uh, I, um, it's way more than 50% of, of, of income. Uh, and it's it's all very well you saying well we don't do it and it, we're too late. Bullshit. You're never too late. You just start now. You, you, you're late, but you're not too late. And unless you start, then your business, I don't think, will will thrive as much as it should. Yeah. Well, I also think that lettings is about the only bit of any businesses these days that actually yields any proper value. If you want to yep. sell your business at any point, the only bit that's worth any money is of course. is the well, in Australia is the business is only valued on its lettings book. The sales bit is that you basically get for free. No, but it's two yeah. and a half to three well, times your lettings book. Well, very good point. I can't believe there are that many agents out there that don't do lettings. There are. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously. Well, they don't do it properly. They, they play at it like like people did in the early days. You know, it was, well, it was someone sitting. Lettings is, one, lettings is one of the areas where tech can really make a difference. Yeah. You know, it's a faster moving business. Um, it's less emotional. Yeah. You know, at Uber, a lot of our people, are, it's about lettings. It's because yep. it's emotionally quick and people just want an open house done or whatever it is. So from a... Um, from a lettings perspective, the things like Good Lord and and all these sort of outfits that produce it's why open rent are doing so well. Yep. You know, open rent are listing three, four thousand lettings properties a month because they're they have a very a, a good platform which you can choose a menu of. So I think there are still plenty of ways that agents can increase their income. Uh, one of the other things, by the way, I know is happening with some agents is the, is offering concierge services. So where people are move, where people are selling through them. They will turn around to them on the you know week before or a month before completion and say, you know, is there anything else we can help with? Here are the here's the cheapest moving person in your area, the best rated moving person in your area, you That's know, great. all these sort of things. So I think people are moving into that quite rightly, and I think that people can laugh at Humberts with what they're doing at the moment. But Humberts have moved back to the hub. Well, not moved back. They have moved to this hub and spoke thing, but they're providing an enormous range of services out of their mm -hmm. hubs. So it'll be fascinating to see what happens with this. Um, sure. Now there's a guy here called Johnny, um, Johnny Engel, Johnny Engler, sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Johnny, but anyway, this has been a very informative session, thank you. My question is how do small hybrid agency, agencies compete with the larger, more established brands? Well, do you know, that's a really, I think that's a fantastic question because the only reason that people understand about hybrid and how it worked is because Purple Brick spent 25 million quid a year on their TV advertising. Yeah know there's a choice if they didn't no one would have a clue and people wouldn't you know clearly it wouldn't work and i think the problem that some of the companies like emu tepelo house network have had recently is that they haven't been spending that sort of money so the knowledge of their brand hasn't been as good so they have found it very difficult to keep going however we know from our figures at Duba that and it, quite a number of our customers are very small ex high street guys who now run without the office Yes. And I think that is an area which is ripe for growth. And I can't see why, if you were sensible, I'm not calling you a back room. You know, some people are very rude and call these people sort of bedroom agents. Once you've got a good knowledge in an area, sometimes you work for a corporate agency and you might not fancy staying in a corporate. You go to an independent agent and the independent agent can often be a sort of dead man's shoes situation where you only really go to <coughs> If someone leaves or one of the partners dies or directors or whatever it is so if you're in your mid late 20s and you don't have an awful lot you don't have sort of you're not married you're not kids you're not all that stuff why wouldn't you think about going and opening <coughs> put yourself a space somewhere build yourself a good network of people that you've already been dealing with yep. make it your business to go to the rugby club to go to the cricket matches talk to proper old-fashioned agency yeah proper old-fashioned old -fashioned agency but just without an office and, and one uh, one really important thing, Johnny, really, really important. Don't be judged just on your bloody fee. For goodness sake, if you think you're good enough to sell the property for a good amount of money, don't give it away. This is this is the madness of agency these days. It's a race to the bottom and still is. And frankly, people will get what they deserve, which is crap agents, because no one wants to go into it because there's no money in it. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I think that the race to the bottom is sort of finished. Do you? Um, I do. I think that most of the people I've been talking to in that space are now working out, because most of them have gone to no sale, no fee anyway. So why not charge what everybody else charges if they're doing a, I mean, to me, the main problem that some of these guys have had is communication. I mean, you know, I do think there are some fantastic solutions out there for estate agents to be able to communicate because no one wants to, you know, if something happens on a Saturday afternoon and they think, Christ, I've got to let, how do I get hold of my agent? You email them. They don't get back to you until lunchtime on Monday. There are some fantastic platforms these days. Things Companies like OneDome produce these platforms where you can simply put your information on the platform and all the parties that need to can see it all the time. So you put your message up there on the platform saying, you know, I really need to know about this as soon as possible or this has changed. And everybody else, the solicitor, the surveyor, the estate agent, the solicitors, everybody can read it. The buyer can all see it straight away. So I think communication is a big issue. But again, for those small um, hybrids, whatever, I prefer to call them sort of off street, high street, really. They're not hybrid, I think, implies that these are online agents, that they're not. They're just doing the job without a, without a front office presence. That's it. That's the only difference. I think there's plenty to come. So um, do I. Absolutely, so do I. Uh, fairly typically, uh, of course, now all the questions are coming in. Thanks, guys. Um, um, Sydney Crosby, great name, Sydney. Um, when do you think low online agents fees will start putting downward pressure on high street agents fees? What do you mean, when do you think they'll start? I mean, you know. <laughs> Sydney, where have you been? Well, you're talking to two people here, Sydney, who used to charge, well, two and a half percent. I was about to say two and a half, three percent. Two and a half, three. Um, and you know the average now nationwide is what I think is one point two, one point three. Yeah. Something like that. I know Marsh and Parsons are still up nearly two percent average fee. Yeah. So they've been able to keep that. And I, I've often I bang on about it till I'm blue in the face. The minute you start reducing that, it is a slippery slope, and it's a it's a disaster. And I've seen it in so many different businesses. It's a disaster, and it's bloody hard to get back up. Yeah, well, I mean, we didn't. No. And actually, the new setup at DNG won't allow this. Everything no. minimum is two percent yep. for anything. Um, yep. But nationwide, people still seem to feel, for some reason, it's the it was for some reason it's the only thing they've got left in their armory is to finally say, well, I'll do it for less than that person, and it just becomes a spiral. Yep. So I don't think that actually has got so much to do with the online agents. I think what's happened is that, and it's certainly true in London, that so many people have left. I mean, if I look at the people that I've worked with over the over the last sort of 25, 30 years at, at, when I was at Douglas and Gordon, there must be, I should think, 20 odd estate agents that have sprung up from people who used to work for me or for Douglas and Gordon. So the market has become much busier and much more saturated. And it's not the online agent. I mean, that that trend has been there for quite some time. You've got to bear in mind that she's selling a property in the UK. It's, it's the cheapest place to sell it, sell in the Western. Well, actually, in the civilized world. Yeah. Ridiculous. I mean, you know, where else do you get the service we get for, for that sort of money? You know, you go anywhere else in the world and it's sort of you know, anywhere from... <laughs> well, I, I don't think you do get great service from the vast majority of estate agents. And, and, I, and I've often said that is why it's such a brilliant business, because if you do give that service and you can charge a proper fee, there's a lot of money to be made. But because of the fees are so low, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a sort of downward spiral. And I, I don't think you get good service because I don't think you can attract great people because you charge too little and you can't pay them very much. So how does that downward spiral stop? Uh, I would say you have to be much, much, much tougher on why you're being asked in. And if you are being asked in just for your, I think that's your first question. Have you brought me in because, because, my, because, because you think I'm going to uh, uh, do it for 1% because I'm not? That's not what we're about. We're not a discount well, agent. Interestingly, I did a podcast um, about a month ago with James Evans, who's the new C current CEO of, yeah. of D and G, who I think actually has just been in Seattle with Kevin Ellis, who just uh, has he? asked this question, he? and he's one of those sort of guys who who he he absolutely insists that it's all about the people. Yeah. It's about it's about having the good people because if you if 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 you sit in front of someone and you're trying to win some business, there's absolutely no doubt that people buy people. I mean, I know they will come to you because you've got a brand and you used to do your wacky advertising. We used to do some wacky advertising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But ultimately, when you get through the door, they're going to buy the person sitting in front of them. Yeah. And interestingly, one of the things that you and I talked about with with what we're doing at Viewber was to try and help people not have to work at weekends. 
it, it was, I think it was originally your idea to go down that that route of, of saying that because at, at Foxton's you'd lost, you just said the quality of people at Foxton's went down because Absolutely. no one wants to work seven days a week. So actually, um, the ability to turn around to your staff and say, well, actually, guys, you don't have to, you know, you're, you're my best staff, you don't have to work at weekends, you know, use these guys to go and do the viewings, you can still earn from it. Keep the good people, because those are the people that go and sit in front and win the business. You know, it's a really important thing that, it's no coincidence that, uh, and I, I don't, I'm not trying to blow their trumpet, but there's, there's, it's no coincidence that the best people do seem to end up going to work for the Knight Franks and Savills of this world, because they end up not having to work at weekends. Every <clears> property <throat> I've ever bought, I haven't bought that many, but I've bought three or four from, from Savills over the last sort of 15 years. I don't think I've ever been shown around by someone who worked for them. No. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Mainly because any time I could do it, because I was so busy, was weekends. Um, and it just shows that there, you know, there, are, there are tech solutions for people to use these days. Um, typical, why, you, look, you guys, you know, we've, we've only been going for 51 <laughs> minutes to ask the flipping questions. Having said that, <laughs> um, this is Chris Munro who said, enjoying the webinar. I'm reading this live, by the way. So if you write something rude, I'll probably just read it out. So you'll be a bit careful with that. Um, Chris Munro said, enjoying the webinar, although they came late. So you may have covered this quick question. In, in your experience, how has technology changed how agencies can interact with vendors and sellers? And how do we choose between all the different solutions? Thanks. Hmm. Um, bloody good question, Chris. Can I make a suggestion? Can I make a suggestion? Um, it's no coincidence that the trade press over the last sort of two or three weeks has been full of two outfits. Um, one of them is called is Ian White's outfit, uh, which is called the Innovation Collaboration Group. And what Ian's done, I don't know Ian at all, really. But what I do know about Ian is that he's quite staggeringly hardworking. It's absolutely <laughs> extraordinary. He's everywhere doing everything. If you look up Ian White, he's I-A-I-N, the Scottish spelling. Look him up on LinkedIn. I've never seen a man with more non-exec positions and consultancy roles. Um, but he went out and he, he road tested along with Repit all the best um, solutions in various different classes. So people who can help you with sales progression or people who can help keep up data leads, outsourcing the yeah. bit that you were talking about, Peter, earlier, the, um, the client services, all yeah. this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and he's got, and it includes Viewer, and he's put them all in one set up so you can go and see all the best in class in one place so that's one way chris mm -hmm. is that you can go to someone like that who's road tested all of it and again ian ian and gary uh, barker at reaper have got no reason to come up with bullshit people because they're going to get found out so i'd like to think the solutions they've got there make sense the other thing that's happening um is that for a lot of agents they can now join things like the guild um fine and country and graham locke's new federation of independent agents now he's known as the FIA, so I suppose you'll probably get a few problems from the Formula One outfit, but um, <laughs> the Federation of Independent Agents is another classic example where Graham has gone out and just looked at a whole load of um, tech solutions and put them all together and give, given people discounts if they want to become a member in their area. So I think there are ways of, of, of sorting that out. I think there are, and I, I agree with all that, Ed. Uh, I do caution the fact of people hiding behind email still. Um, I know you may call me old fashioned and a dinosaur, but there is nothing better than actually getting on the telephone in many, many cases um, that and people don't. They hide, they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth with emails and nothing ever gets done and it, everything takes forever. So there will be occasions when uh, your people will want to um, want to send emails and, and, and use tech, but actually uh, low tech, old tech is, um, is, is often the way to go. And so it's a combination of the two. Don't think it's just one or the other. Yeah, I mean, I think Chris's question was also very good insofar as it said, um, how's it going to help our interaction with buyers and sellers? To me, uh, it's very telling that the process takes even longer now than it did in our day. Yeah. It's yeah. madness. How, how can that be? It's but crazy. it takes longer to get from agreed to exchange. That is just madness. Yeah. Now, whether that's because the quality of the people on the conveyancing side have gone down, I don't know. I'll probably get... I, I'll get one or two people coming on to me and saying, well, that's rubbish. But I, you know, it has become a commodity. Certainly, I would always recommend one or two solicitors who I know are brilliant. They cost a bit more, but you get what you yep. pay for, I think, sometimes. Absolutely. Um, uh, the other thing is the communication thing, Chris. I just think sometimes these platforms, uh, and again I, I, again, I really would point you towards one day. I think they've got a fantastic platform for communication. I think it's brilliant. Um, okay, so... Um, Kevin now I can't shut him up. He's saying, "What did you do with country? What did you do with countrywide?" Well, 
Do you know what? I think Countrywide's a fantastic opportunity for someone, Kevin. Countrywide is currently valued at 121 million. I think it's a billion pound company. I think that's a very, very good deal for someone. I don't think it's going to take a lot to get them going back in the right direction again. But uh, so what would you do with Countrywide? I'd buy them. It's a big <laughs> lot to turn around. Bloody hell. Uh, I would bet I would bet they'll be they'll be um, they'll be split up. Has your phone been ringing, Peter? Have they been on the phone to you? No, no. <laughs> so what's next? Well, actually, I'm not going to say. What's next for Peter? I know he has one or two things, guys, in the pipeline. I know he does. <laughs> There's going to be some huge announcement. Open soon. to offers. <laughs> that sounds a bit desperate. Um, okay. Um, Kevin, we couldn't get a word in edgeways when you started talking, so left the questions yet. Well, it serves you right for being so late, Kevin. You should have asked earlier. Um, now, look, we're coming up to an hour. And I know my attention span is normally about five minutes. Um, Peter's is slightly longer. Um, and I would like to think we'll do this again, because I think they're great forums for people to come and talk. And it's great for us to learn the questions people ask. And I think some of the questions that you've just asked there absolutely show why the stuff that we're doing can help you to stand out. But the trouble is, actually, that I think it was Chris asked that question where how do we know which solutions to use? That's a really big one. Because a lot of you agents just get completely bored of having prop tech people traipsing in one after, oh, I got a really good idea. They use the word disruption. Who ever thought that going into an estate agent and telling them they're going to disrupt the industry thought that was a good idea? Number one, collaboration. We're here to help, you know. Um, and having been on both sides of the fence, I can quite see why you guys get pissed off with having tech people traipsing in and out. But there is some really good stuff there to use. So, um, you know, look around and, um, and, and try it out. Um, in the absence of anything else. Um, Let's get on with our lives. Lives. Well, there is one more. How long do you think the largest online agent will last with sales fees as low as 899? Uh, I don't know. It's a straightforward answer, Sydney. I mean, I would watch this space. I don't think, you know, you've got to, there, just to finish on this, Countrywide was an easily a billion pound company before. It's now valued. At, it's now got a net worth of, what, 120 million. Purple Bricks was a whatever the hell it was billion. It's certainly at least a billion, two billion pound company. That's now capitalized at 400 million. Who says there won't be some sort of deal that's done between? Who says that Purple Bricks won't suddenly go, go no sale, no fee? Who knows what they'll do? But it, it, you'd probably be interested to know, and I'm sure you do know this, that the majority of the fees that Purple Bricks charge are not in London and the South East, they're up north. And they're more than you'd pay a normal estate agent. So Clearly, the public likes a lot of what they're doing in terms yep. of the communication offering, the ability to control stuff themselves. So people should learn. From underestimate that. them at your at your at your. It's dangerous to underestimate them. Yeah, I think it's really dangerous. So, so I think on that note, bearing in mind that we're coming out to an hour, I'd like to say thanks to you guys for listening. Thank you very much. Um, behind the scenes, James Chalice and Heidi um, Borden, thank you very much for making this happen and uh, getting the webinar up and running. Uh, appreciate that very much. And uh, most of all, thanks to, he's sitting on my right, this idiot over here for joining us uh, as well. Very nice to see you, Peter. Um, and uh, let's hope we can do it again soon. So thanks very much. Thanks, Ed. Well done. See, see you ya. soon. Bye. Bye.